before we get into uh, week two, the second message of this series, <clears throat> real quick, I want you to get your phones out and uh, open up your calendar app. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm watching you. Some of you aren't doing it. This is all skate. Everyone needs to do this. Get your phones out and uh, on your calendar app, mark two weeks from today, Sunday, August 25th, excuse me, 28th, 28th. That is uh, Vision Sunday here at Family Church. I've got some uh, very, very important things to share with you. So uh, I want you uh, to make sure to be here for that. Trust me, you want to be here for that, okay? Vision Sunday, two weeks from today, Sunday, August 28th. You know, something that we all do but probably don't think much about is uh, when we talk to ourselves. See, I told you, you don't, you don't think. See, you guys got jobs and kids and practices to go to and recitals. So, you know, you, you don't think about those things. But see, I'm a pastor, and sometimes I got to come up with introductions to sermons. So I think about some of these weird things sometimes. But think about this. I want to talk about your, your, your self-talk here, right? Think about how often you talk to yourself. Does anyone beside me talk to yourself? Yeah, some of you are honest with yourselves, right? And sometimes it seems like there's not just two of you. Sometimes it seems like there's three of you in there, right? Like you have this conversation, all of a sudden someone else chimes in. It's like, right? Now, if, if you've got four of you in there, I don't know that I want to meet you. Just go ahead and stay where you're at because that's kind of weird. But anyway, uh, the, the, the fact that we can even do that, I think, is a testament to the amazing mind, brain that God created us with that we're even able to do that. But these conversations that we have with ourselves cover a variety of topics depending on what's going on in our lives at the time. But most of these conversations we have with ourselves usually lead us down a path that we come up to this question. At the end of that path is this question here, and it's the question, why? Why? Something happens, and our first thought is, why? Why did that happen? Or, or why did that happen as opposed to this happening? Or why did this happen? Man, that's not what I thought would happen. We, we can't help it. We just go there. We're wired to want to connect the dots and make sense of life, which is why we all have this habit or this inclination to impose reason on the randomness of life or what seemingly randomness of life. Something happens that doesn't make sense, and our minds immediately kick into gear, and within seconds, we're asking why. Why, 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 did that, why did that happen? And in this process, and here's the point that I'm going, there's why I'm taking us down this path. In this process of trying to connect the dots and make sense of, this, of these seemingly random events and circumstances of life, in the process of doing that, uh, we create our own self-talk or our own narrative, if you will. And this narrative helps form our values, our convictions, and even how we view the world, for that matter. I kind of touched on this last week in the opening message when I, I talked about the things that we tell ourselves when we get our mind really set on something because when we really want something, but yet there's a little bit of a pushback, you know, there's kind of like we really want it, but there's something inside you's like, eh, I don't know if I should do that, see? At that point, if we really want it, we don't care about, you know, we just, we just blow right by that pushback because we start giving ourselves a sales pitch. Remember I talked about, what's your sales pitch? What do you tell yourself when you really want something, but part of you, eh, I don't know if I should do that or not, right? That's your narrative. That's your narrative. We're in part two of our series where we're talking about ways to keep from becoming our own worst enemy. And when we start going down a path where we begin trying to talk ourselves into doing something that part of us is wondering if we should do or not, that's where we got to be really careful because at that point we start lying to ourselves. And when we start lying to ourselves, look out because that is the first step towards becoming your own worst enemy. You think about that. When you start lying to yourself, you're, you're not very far away from becoming, making choices and decisions that will make you your own worst enemy, right? So in this series, we've been looking at some principles uh, three specific things that we can do to help keep us from becoming our own worst enemy. Three, I'm calling them preemptive strikes that we can all begin doing to, again, keep ourselves from becoming our own worst enemy. Last week, we looked at preemptive strike number one, which was pay attention to the tension. Pay attention to the tension. Whenever you're considering an option or a choice or a, a big decision or a large purchase or whatever it is, whatever it might be, if there's any hesitation within you, if something dings your conscience, Pay attention. Pay attention to that. If something seems not, not, it's just not a little bit, something's a little bit off-center, 
Doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter how it seems, doesn't matter how it appears, doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, right? You need to pay attention to that tension and ask the question, is there a tension that deserves my attention? And that was your homework. That was one of the questions. To ask yourself, is there a tension in my life that deserves my attention? This week, we're going to look at preemptive habit number two. And preemptive habit number two is simply this. Pay attention to your narratives. So you got to pay attention to your tension, but also pay attention to your narratives, your self-talk. And by narratives, again, to make sure that we're tracking together on this, by narratives, I'm referring to how we view life based on our life experiences and environment in which we live or live. Now, I think uh, the best way to maybe kind of help understand this, I need to take you back in time a little bit. Well, some of you, some of you might be there right now, but those of you that are post-high school, mid-20s or older, think about what your narrative was regarding your parents back when you were in school. What, 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 what was the narrative regarding your parents when you were in high school or middle school? Remember how they just didn't get it? Remember how clueless they were? Remember how uncool they were? They, they just did not get you and your world, right? right? But then something happened when you got to mid to late 20s and your 30s, right? All of a sudden, you realized maybe your parents were a little smarter than, than you thought they were, right? And then suddenly, it didn't matter that they were uncool. Of course, you know, I, I was always cool, but I'm talking about you guys, right? But what, cha- what changed? What changed in how you do your narrative changed. And your narrative changed because the more sunrises and sunsets we live through, we kind of get some experience and all of a sudden we do see life a little bit differently, right? So we're talking about our narratives, right? And so you think about, you know, the narrative you had back in school, you know. I mean, it wasn't necessarily bad, but sometimes it got you into trouble, didn't it? How many will admit, man, sometimes my narrative got me into trouble because I made some choices and decisions based on that narrative that I shouldn't have made. I think another great example of how our narrative can impact our lives and relationships is seen in marriage. Those of you that are married, you know this. My parents divorced when I was in fourth grade. Sue's folks got married the year I was born, right? So think about that. They celebrated their 66th wedding anniversary this past June, okay? So you think Sue and I had different narratives in marriage? You think we approached our marriage with the same narratives? No, 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 no. You think those narratives didn't cause friction at times, right? We didn't want to be that way. That, that, that's, that's, what, that's what we grew up with, and that, that's what helped form our narratives. But you know what? This Thursday, 43 years, babe, 43 years, this Thursday, right? And you know what? We, we worked through that. We worked through, anytime we reach an impasse, I say, honey, you can have your opinion, and God and I will have ours, and then we move on past it, Right? <laughs> Seriously, when I, when I do premarital counseling, those of you have, that have done it with me, you, you probably know this, but when I do premarital counseling with couples, of the seven lessons that we go through, three of them address this very thing. That's how, that's how I'm, it, they use, we use different verbiage, but it's the same thing because that's how I'm, this is huge. This, this is huge. That's how important this is. The point being, it never occurred to us that, that our view of marriage or our view of our, our parents or our view of our family or our view of anything, for that matter, life in general, it never occurred to us that that was all shaped by our self-talk, our narratives. And you know what? We still have them. We still have those narratives. And experts, the, the people who study these things, say that while narratives can vary and, and you know, look a lot different... Uh, they all eventually will be funneled through one of these four categories, all right? The first narrative category is personalizing. This is where you blame yourself for everything. Say things like, oh, this is all my fault. Or maybe a more subtle backdoor. You know, this, would, this wouldn't have happened if, right, if I, right? So you've got, you've got personalizing. And then you've got the magnifying narrative. And this is where you focus on the negative aspects of a situation and you ignore all the positive. Uh, you, so you say things like, this is, man, this is as good as it, you know, as good as it gets. This is it, right? Ain't going to get any better than this, right? Or, or maybe it's like, I, I should be further along than I am right now. Or maybe it, it manifests in this statement, you know, I deserve better. I deserve better. The third category, and this is, I don't think this is technically a word, but it's, this is what they said, so I'm going to go ahead and put it on there. Catastrophizing. Catastrophizing narrative. This is where you expect the worst, and you rarely let logic or reason persuade you any otherwise, right? 
And this is where you make statements like, it won't make any difference. It's not going to do any good. It won't make any difference, right? Or, you know what? This is a train wreck. I'm just telling you right now, this is a train wreck. And then the fourth category of narrative is polarizing. And uh, you know this, but this is huge right now. This, 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 is, this is huge. You see the world in black and white or good and bad. There's no middle ground for, process, for processing and categor, categorizing life events, right? And so it's kind of manifested in statements like this. Republicans are all... Hmm? Democrats are just a bunch of... Right? How about this? Vaxxers. Ooh, now I'm getting home. Anti-vaxxers. Right? How about this one? K-State Wildcats. <laughs> Kansas Jayhawks. Look, th- th- I'm trying to have fun here. Don't get mad at me. I'm just trying to help you see that we all have narratives about these things. Narratives, narratives that were shaped and formed by our environment and life experiences. Again, our narratives aren't necessarily bad, but sometimes they're not necessarily good and beneficial either. Because your narrative, the, the thing that you continue to, now think about this, the thing that you continue to tell yourself, this is huge, don't miss this, the thing that you continue to tell yourself over and over and over, that more than anything else shapes your decisions and choices in life. And because our narratives have so much influence over our choices and decisions, they also have the potential to cause us to become our own worst enemy at times. See, this is what made the Apostle Paul's call to preach the gospel to the Gentiles so challenging. Think about this. The Gentile narrative was completely different from the Jewish narrative. At least the Jewish narrative included the idea of of a single supreme God. Not so with the Gentiles. Not so with the Gentiles. The Roman Empire was a polytheistic civilization where people worshiped multiple gods and goddesses. So, so when Paul presented this new idea about a single God, he was basically asking them to change their, their narrative, their narrative, their whole worldview. Some did. Many didn't. And those who didn't, they weren't just judgmental towards Paul. They were, they were downright hostile towards him. So with all this going on, you think about it, with all this going on, it's a miracle that Paul had any traction in, the, in that pagan polytheistic first century worldview. But in one of his letters to some non-Jewish Gentile Christians living in an ancient city, Greek city called Corinth, Paul actually addresses this secular worldview and this narrative. And when you understand ancient Corinth, you'll understand why these Gentiles had the narrative that they did. Ancient Corinth was, was a port city, which meant there was a lot of money, and money tends to attract a lot of things, some good, some not so good. So in, in, in many ways, Corinth was a, a very secular, self-indulgent, pleasure-seeking, hedonistic city. Think Las Vegas. Think, think Las Vegas, a place where for the right price, you could get whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, however you wanted, anytime you wanted, all right? So in trying to confront and expose the Corinthians' false, unhealthy narratives and worldview, the Apostle Paul does something that he only did twice in all of his letters. He uses military language. This is, this is fascinating. He uses military language, and I think he did this to punctuate how difficult this can be to confront and change our inner narrative. So Paul uses this extreme language to say, look, if you're going to get rid of these false narratives, you, you, you got to tell, you know, that, that gives you these excuses to not do what you know you're supposed to do. You're going to have to go on the attack. This isn't just going to happen. You're going to have to go on the offensive. Here's what he said in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. He says, we destroy, destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive, another military term, to obey Christ. So here, Paul's challenging these first century non-Jewish Jesus followers, and he's, he's challenging us today by the Holy Spirit to change our self-talk, change our inner narrative, that, our, that part of our narrative that, that isn't in line with God's kingdom and God's ethic. But he says, this is something you're going to have to initiate. It's not going to happen on its own. He says, we destroy. Literal translation, we go on the offensive. We have to initiate this because we're in a war. 
We're in a war. He's challenging them, challenging us to attack the walls that protect our ignorance, our false assumptions, our false narratives, our flawed worldview, our flawed self-view, and our flawed view of even others. Then once we tear it down, it says we need to rebuild it with a different worldview, a different value system. One that Jesus introduced to the world, and he called this new worldview, this new value system, he called it the kingdom of God. And he invited everyone to participate in it. But to embrace this new worldview, this godly view, you got to get rid of some of the things that you have thought and believed your entire life. Things you never chose to believe, but because of where you live and your environment growing up, you just kind of naturally, they became a part of your life, right? But keep in mind, Paul's writing to a group of people who grew up. Now, think about this. Paul's writing to a group of people who grew up with a narrative that believed that people were property to be bought and sold. That's how it was in the first century. It had nothing to do with race. This this was all about economics. The assumption was might makes right. Whoever's got the most weapons and the biggest army, they determine what is right. The apostle Paul shows up one day and tells them that God's, he's doing something new here. He's doing something new. But to embrace this new thing that God has done, you're going to have to renew your minds, change your way of thinking and, and, and how you've always viewed the world. He then proceeds to give them these instructions for getting rid of these false narratives. In verse 3, 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Literally, this means we do not conduct our military campaigns the way the world does. He goes on in verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now, it's interesting. The the word that Paul uses here for weapons, it's not referring to that, you know, like the the hand-to-hand combat weapons that a soldier would use, you know, in the the heat of the battle, like swords, shields, spears, you know, those kind of things. No, the the word that he uses here, he's he's talking about the, the weapons that would be used to either break through the wall that surrounded the city or help scale the wall so they could tear it down. Isn't that interesting? That's the word. He, when he's talking, he's talking about getting through that wall, breaking through those walls. Note the word strongholds. A stronghold would be like a stone wall around a city or, or a stone wall around a, a palace or some kind of stone structure. And he says, the weapons that we use have power to destroy even the strongest structures. Now, if you're still having a hard time connecting the dots between this combat, this battle that Paul's talking about here and, and where you're at in your life, You say, well, I don't know, break down any wall or, you know, that kind of thing. Well, let's read on because Paul tells us what this has to do with you and with me. In verse 5, 2 Corinthians 10, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So understand, when Paul is talking about destroying strongholds, he's talking about, he's talking about their unhealthy talk, their, their inner narrative. He says, we're, we're demolishing arguments, not, not physical stone walls. We're waging war on the flawed conclusions, the false assumptions that drive our choices and decisions. Do you see that? I want you to see how you're, this, this is how we make connection. This is how this applies to us. We're destroying arguments, he says. And then he uses a really interesting word that's translated a lot of different ways because it's kind of hard to nail down. But, but basically, he's talking about something that is, that is high or lofty. The Living Bible translates verse 5 this way. It says, we pull down every proud obstacle that is raised against the knowledge of God and every wall that can be built to keep men from finding him. Paul says that we're coming against every high thing, every arrogant attitude that prevents people from coming to God. You ever heard someone, an arrogant person described as, as being so high and mighty? So he's talking about here, that haughtiness, that, that pride, that pride. But it doesn't stop there. The battle, this, this, this warfare continues. In fact, in some ways, it actually intensifies once you surrender to Christ because when you, when you come to Christ, you, you switch teams. <laughs> when you come to Jesus, you're on the winning team at that point, and Satan don't like it. Satan, well, I didn't know I was serving uh, Satan. Well, if you weren't serving God, just saying, right? But, but notice, notice the word captive. He says, we, we take captive every thought. 
just like you see in the movies where POWs have been, have been captured and taken captive, and then they're, they're marched along, you know, chained ankle to ankle, wrist to wrist. Paul says that that's what we need to do with any narrative, any self-talk, any worldview that goes against God. But we don't just capture them. After capturing them, we're to make them obedient or we're to make them conform to God's worldview as seen through the kingdom of God that Jesus Christ came to introduce us to. This is why reading the Gospels, this is why reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is, is so important because in the Gospels, in the Gospels, we get a glimpse of what the kingdom of God would look like if every Jesus follower would embrace this, this godly view. Toward the end of Jesus' life, he was meeting with his guys in an upper room, giving them some final instructions. He, it's just a few hours away from him being arrested and tortured and eventually crucified, but... Um, He's meeting with his guys, and he knows his time's limited, so he's, he's having this very important conversation with them. Trying, he says, look, I'm giving you a heads up. He says, look, I'm about to leave you guys. And, you know, they're clueless, even though he's been telling them that for two and a half, three years. They still don't get it. They don't understand it. But he says, look, I'm about to leave you guys. And Peter chimes in, where are you going? I want to go with you. <laughs> it's kind of funny when you read it. But, uh, and, and, and Jesus says, you can't go with me. Where I'm going, Peter, you can't go. And then he talks about he's going to leave him the Holy Spirit. But it's interesting because in the course of this conversation, he says, I'm leaving you, but where I'm going, you can't go. And Peter says, well, I want to go. Where are you going? How come I can't go with you? And in the middle of that conversation, Philip chimes in. Philip chimes in. And he, and he said, and you remember, this, and, and Philip asks Jesus a question. He says, show us the father. What's the father like? What's, what, no, what's God like? What's God like? Just, just show us what God's like, and, and that'll be enough for us, Jesus. You say you're leaving, that's okay. Just show us what God is like, and then, 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 we'll, then we'll be good to go. Just show us the Father. And you know what? Philip was right. It's really a great question. Here's why. If we could see as God sees, we would be more inclined to do as God says. That's tweetable right there. I'm going to read that again. <laughs> if we could see as God sees, we would be more inclined to do as God says. See, if you could see yourself the way that God sees you, you would be more inclined to do what God asks of you. If you could see the people around you the way that God sees those people, you would be more inclined to treat them the way that God would treat them and the way that God would want you to treat them. Now, do you remember Jesus' response to Philip? Right? And, you know, looking back, we, we cannot appreciate how powerful of a moment that this was when Philip asked Jesus this question and then Jesus gave him this answer. It's one of those moments that all those disciples, the moment Jesus said, made this statement, they should have all got up and walked out of the room. It was so blasphemous. Philip says, just show us the Father. And Jesus smiles and he looks at Philip just as he looks at you and me right now. And he says, don't you know me, Philip? Don't you know me? Right? Even after I've been with you these years, these past few years, and then he says the most amazing thing. He says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, don't miss this. In other words, Jesus said, you want to know what God's like? Watch me. Watch me. You want to know what God's like? Follow me. You want to know what God thinks about you? Listen to me. Listen to what I say. You want to know what God thinks about the people around you who are nothing like you and don't like you? Listen to me. You want to know how to live a liberating, life-giving life with, with, with a godly, heavenly narrative, one that will correctly inform your conscience, that will correctly correct your false assumptions? Then follow me because I have come to introduce the kingdom of God to earth and everyone is invited to participate in it. But... You'll never be able to fully participate until you attack, destroy, and take captive the false narratives that support all of your incorrect assumptions. Because those assumptions sometimes lead to not just wrong ways of thinking, but even prejudice. Jesus said, follow me, and you'll begin to change the way you think. Follow me and you'll have a brand new narrative. Follow me and you'll see the world as it is, which is broken and messed up. That's the bad news. The good news is our Heavenly Father redeems broken things. God fixes broken things. That was the promise. But the flip side to that was a warning. And the warning was, if you don't do these things and allow these kingdom principles to change your self-talk and change your inner narrative, 
then you're going to have the potential to become your own worst enemy. And then Paul closes the same passage with these words that could be so easily misunderstood, but he's making a a powerful point here. He says this. He's just got done talking about taking every thought captive, and he concludes with this statement in verse 6, 2 Corinthians 10. Being ready, it's still a military term. He says, we'll be standing at attention. That's what he's talking about. We'll be standing at attention to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. The idea here is is just to bring justice, to to respond appropriately, ready to punish every act of disobedience. And, and, And the idea here is that we, as individuals, we need to be ready to react swiftly anytime one of those false narratives begins to creep into our mind again. Once it tries to come in, or no, 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 stay, no, rebuke, cast it down. You got to cast it down at that point. Cast it down. So here's a question, and I'm going to go ahead and give, give you the answer before I ask the question because I'm going to tell you right now the answer is yes, all right? So here's the question. Do you have any strongholds that need to be demolished? And what's the answer? Yes, yes. Say, well, isn't that kind of judgmental, Pastor? No, that's just a fact. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not, look, I'm, you know, I'm not pointing just at you. This is all of us. All of us have these, right? It's true of you. It's true of me because I can't help the way that I was raised, where I lived. You can't help the way that you were raised and where you grew up and what you were taught and your education and what you had and what you didn't have. You can't help any of that. So consequently, we are always at war potentially with the narratives that, that want to creep up and misinterpret the world around us. Pay attention to your narratives. Pay attention to your narratives. Here's how you know your incorrect narrative could cause you to become your own worst enemy. All you have to do is think back to a season in your life when you were your own worst enemy. Think back to what, when that happened, all right? And I guarantee you, guarantee you, you had a supporting narrative for those decisions that you made that caused you to become your own worst enemy. Guaranteed. You think about it. You had a narrative that caused you to make the choices and decisions that you did that led you down that path to where you became your own worst enemy. When you think back to that season, that decision, that relationship, whatever it was, where you were your own worst enemy, you had a supporting narrative to support those decisions that you now regret. And that narrative stood in stark contrast to the the liberating, life-giving narrative that Jesus introduced to the world and invited us to step into. So I've got an idea. I stole it from Paul. It was his idea. But let's do this. How about we take every thought captive? How's that? Does that sound like a plan? How about we take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ? Last week, I asked you to make a commitment as it related to pay attention to the tension all right. Here's the commitment that I want you to consider this week. Would you be willing to commit to doing what the Apostle Paul said to do in this passage that we looked at this morning? Would you be willing to spend some time with Jesus in the war room, in the, in, you know, strategizing in the, in the spiritual war room, right? And then go on the offensive and to use Paul's military terms, attack, assault, and destroy every narrative, every narrative that conflicts with the value system that Jesus Christ came and introduced to us and invited us to be a part of. And those are pretty violent terms. But you know what? We live in a violent world. And there's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake. Determined to tear down every narrative. Determined to tear down every narrative. The moment it starts coming into your mind, no, 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 rebuke it, come against it, cast it down, right? Right? Say, wait a minute, no, 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 that's not what Jesus would do. Wait a minute, that's not, a, that's not what a God follower would do. No, no, no. I will demolish every narrative that conflicts with the value system introduced by Jesus. And you know what? I can't think of any better time to attack, assault, and destroy our false narratives than during our 21 days of prayer. Really, th- this is the best time to do this, right? Remember, Paul told us that this, this, this battle that we're in, it's a spiritual battle. It's, battle. it's a spiritual battle, a battle that takes place in an unseen arena with unconventional weapons. And, and two of the most powerful weapons at our disposal for spiritual warfare are what we're doing during this 21 days of prayer, prayer and fasting. That's it. Now, I, I, you know, I don't have a lot 
time to talk about fasting, but if we knew, here's what Jesus basically said two things about fasting. If we knew nothing else about them, it would be enough. Here's what he said. He said, number one, he said he expected the Latter-day Church to do it. He talked about that. He expected the end times church to fast. And here's the other thing he said, and this is huge. He said, there are certain spiritual strongholds that couldn't be broken apart from it. And if we knew nothing else about fasting, that's enough right there. He expected us to do it, and he said, look, you're going to bump into some things that you're not going to be able to get past unless you fast before you do that. So basically, fasting is disconnecting from the world. That's between you and God, however you want to do that. Disconnect from the world, and prayer is connecting with God. Fasting, disconnecting from the world, prayer, connecting with God. I'm told, too, I said, I've doubled up on my prayer time during the 21 days of prayer. I'm, 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 I'm doubling the amount of time I spend in prayer. She said, what are you fasting? I said, liver and onions. <laughs> Not really, but. <laughs> Seriously, you, you, you should, this is the best time to do these things that the Apostle Paul challenged us to do in this passage. You hear us talk about following Jesus, how following Jesus will make your life better and make you better at life. And if you want to know what it looks like to follow Jesus, this is it. This is it. It's tearing down everything inside of us that works against the kingdom of God that he wants to live out through us. That's what discipleship is, really. You probably never thought of it that way, but that, that, that's what it is. That's what it is. Because in the end, when you follow Jesus, odds are you'll never become your own worst enemy again if you're following Jesus and the principles that he taught. So pay attention to the tension, but pay attention to the narratives. Pay attention to your self-talk as well. So here's your homework, and then I want to pray for you. Got some questions. Did you grow up with a narrative that you had to correct later in life? Was it related to one of these? Money? A class of people? Religion? Politics? Second question, name one narrative or argument you need to demolish. And how does that contrast with the invitation to follow Jesus? Name one narrative or argument you need to demolish. And then third, how would your life change if you changed the narrative that you just mentioned in question two? How would your life change if you changed the narrative that you just listed in question two? Bow your heads. Let me pray for you. Again, the first thing I want you to do is right now just ask the Holy Spirit, what, what did you want me to learn from this message? Some of you already know. But go ahead and ask him anyway. He might have more for you. Just say, Holy Spirit, what did you want me to learn from this message? And Lord, as we wrestle with our narratives and answer these questions, help us to be honest with you and with ourselves so that we can indeed see the world as you see. And as we do, reframe our situation, our circumstances in a way that will that will help us to trust you and begin making choices and decisions that will align with your narrative, your worldview, and the kingdom of God that Jesus Christ invited us to be a part of. If you're here this morning or part of our EFAM watching our live stream and you've never accepted the invitation to God's kingdom that he sent through Jesus Christ, or maybe you did it one time, but you're currently not in an ongoing, growing relationship with him, it would be my honor to uh, lead you in a prayer where you can come to know your creator, your heavenly father, who loves you so dearly and has a plan for your life. If you'd let me lead you in a prayer, there's nothing magical about the words. The power comes when you exercise your faith in what, what he did for you and what you're about to pray. So if that's you, if you would just be willing to just repeat after me the simple prayer. Say, say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm broken and I can't fix myself, but I believe you can. I believe you can, Lord. Your word says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he rose from the dead, that we, that we would be saved. So I'm making that confession now. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he died for me, for my sins, and that he rose from the dead. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me live my life for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name.